Now we've got our first panel of the day. We are going to be discussing the future of VCO. But first of all, we've got a very special video to show you. Yeah, Vicarus started as a crazy idea. I met Christoph Sieber. We chatted about what we do in the real world, what we do in real life. We share the passion for sim racing. This is what was obvious from the start. And then the ideas, yeah, started coming. So we had the idea to create a brand, a race car brand, and to bring in all the professional experience that we have from the real world into setting up something virtual. This was the starting point, really. The whole crew at Munich Design Office was like a revelation. They are so professional with so many cool projects in the real world, but they share our passion for sim racing for the virtual world. These guys are so creative. They bring in all their experience into this project, treating it completely as if it would be a real car. And uh, up to now, it's been a fantastic time and a great experience working with them. I'm Christoph, Christoph Sieber, Managing Director of Munich Design. I heard about the VCO team sometimes before and it was, they are heroes for me. So we started together and fast we realized that we have the same mindset, the same ideas about sim racing, about racing. With Max as a team leader, we started to build up the GT3 and we understand really fast we need also a brand for this car. We created Vicarus as a brand. The Vicarus project was a great opportunity for the whole team to work on a full-size race car with all its details. With a physical race car, you are quite limited on the design aspect because it's all about performance. But when you design a virtual race car, design is equally important for enhancing the experience for the pilots as well as for the audience. From the design team's point of view, the biggest challenge really was to create a unique signature for a new brand. Something that's recognizable, competitive in a GT3 grid, but still being really unique in itself. In a sense, we had to compete with real manufacturers because they provide GT3 cars for sim racing. Vicaros being a solely digital car brought a lot of opportunities, so we could work on active aerodynamic parts that would be restricted in the GT3 series, for example. We can design a truly driver-focused interior, being in your triple screen monitor setup or your VR headset, you really feel like you're in something that is created just for the sim racing experience. Now we have a final design that is yet to be implemented into the game, but will be an enjoyable and, and really nice to race vehicle. After announcing this car merely a few weeks ago, we've been so excited to not only talk about it, but to see the car. And while we have two experts on this subject, we have got from Munich Design, Christoph Siebel, and from VCO, Florian Hasper. Gentlemen, should we go take a seat? Yeah. Well, yeah, welcome to the Sim Racing Expo. Yeah, thank you. thank you. It's great being here. And uh, yeah, we've been here last year as well. We talked about what we would do uh, over the season. And uh, yeah, it's great to be back with a new topic. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's the Expo, of course. You, you were there at the Nürburgring last year. Now it's here in Nuremberg. It's how big is it? How big it's got? Are you surprised by what you've seen so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not surprised, really. I, I think it's what I expected in the terms of uh, outcome and the and the audiences here and so on and so many things to explore in the in the huge hall and uh, yeah it just shows that sim racing is still progressing and it's growing and uh, yeah everyone was talking about a sim racing boom last year or in 2020 I think the boom is yet to come yeah, and we're in the middle of it um, yeah so it's just great that Kovana and all, and the and the ADAC are just doing this and keep doing it because I think it's it's the place to be. And um, yeah, so it's amazing to see how sim racing is progressing. We love niceties, but they want to hear about the car. Let's talk about the, the concept car that you've designed for Vicarus from Munich Design. Take it away. It's your baby. Sell it. Yeah, we started together. Our idea was to create a car for sim racing, only for sim racing, getting something absolutely spectacular in the street. And yeah, I think we created Our advice was always to jump into a GT3 car. Like a little bit Sorry. It was always building up a GT3 car that, that is competitive with all the cars we have on the streets and the sim racing cars. And I think we created it and I hope you can see some more pictures about it. I mean, generally, you know, we all also run a sim racing team, as you know, and there was 
always some talking among the drivers. Uh, okay, we are lacking, let's say, a car which has great physics and that everyone wants to drive and so on. Uh, not lacking, there are many great cars out there, but there was something, can't we create something completely new and uh, yeah, do it really driver orientated, that we do something which is top notch. Yeah? And then this was the initial, let's say, input, and then we met yeah? and I said, okay, there is a chance that we do it together with, uh, let's say, with the know-how of VCO and the know-how of Munich Design. Uh, and it was a crazy idea at the beginning, but then uh, it just grew from there and we knew, okay, we don't want to be a modder, we just do one car, but we have to create the full range and to really come up with a, with a full car brand. Yeah? And this is how, step by step, we got the idea and so Vicarus was created. Yeah? How do you feel like we can uh, configure that? How can we make a car brand? Obviously, this is the first step. Where do you see us being maybe in 12 months' time? First step, of course, is to going up to the to the racetrack with the car. I think this needs. We are, our goal is to start in February with your IMSA series. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are. This is this is the crucial bit to get the car running. Yeah, and uh, and the goal with Vicarus is not just to do one car, but a full range. Yeah, but the timeline. I mean, as we tackle all this uh, so professionally, it just takes time to design the cars. I mean, I think we started three months ago. Or four months, even yeah. That's uh, more, yeah. yeah. So, it, so, it, so it was a it was a long process. So it is quite real everything that we do. Now we are currently working on the physics of the first car, uh, but I think it would be great to show the first car. Yeah, there we have it. Um, <clears throat> I think we also have the the full renderings. So showing it for the for the first time in uh, in yeah full full beauty. Yeah, and um, and the special bit is also the. The name, I would say, so the first model is called Vicarus H, A-E-C-H, yeah, I don't know, it's a, uh, if you know that, but it's a character of Ready Player One, this movie, and uh, so this will be the, this will be the typology for the, for the, for the coming cars, so the first one is the H, yeah, and H is a very powerful character in Ready Player One, uh, but um, in the real world it's a woman, yeah, so there's, uh, a bit of an embodiment of what we want to do with VCO. It's always surprising people to a certain degree. And uh, yeah, we try to continue this also even in this, in this race car brand topic. Yeah? So the Vicarus H is the first car, it's a GT car. Um, we plan to implement it to as many sims as possible. Yeah? So the first one ideally will be R Factor 2 um, early in 23. And uh, yeah, the plan is to race it for the first time at the eSports Racing World Cup that we do, uh, that we do at the end of February. I'm really interested to know the process, so I'm just a sim racer, a nerd, really excited for the space, and I just want content. Oh, a new car, I want to drive that. What's the process in designing it and getting it into a game? First, the process was uh, less to get it in the game. The first process was really starting like a full car project and going to the street. What's the package for a car? So we started with a GT3 package based on all the GT3s we have. We decided for a package that makes, that gives us a lot of freedom to make the car absolutely beautiful. And our, our freedom was that the first time we, we built a car without a full package. So aerodynamics has to be optical looking inside, but we don't need it. So this is, was the big effort for us and the big chance for our design team, building something up what is absolutely, maybe for the street not possible, but for the race car it's, it makes it real reasonable. And, and by the, the full process, starting from the first sketches, like you have seen in the video, starting with ideas, ideations, coming to renderings, first 3D models, building some packages up. Yeah. Full. And I mean, by the same token, you know, we were, I think we, we both agreed that we want to create something which is not over the top, like a virtual concept supercar that is uh, not authentic. So I think Vicarus is a, is a brand that could race in the real world. And I think this is... This is the, the guideline for us. So there are new things in there and innovations and freedoms that uh, were taken. But, um, yeah, but it's not going totally crazy. Yeah. And uh, I think this is very important to us. What's the plan with the linking with VCO in the short term? How are we going to be implementing this into not only you know, consumers' hands, but competition? Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing is that we have created a certain VCO landscape uh, over the last years. And, uh, um, I mean, if you follow our competitions, it's whenever we can, we avoid BOP problems. Yeah, So, so we race just with one car. And so this is just ideal for us that we, that we host events where we can use our own brand, let's say Vicarus, uh, and, and showcase both of it. So we come up with, let's say, innovative concepts and f competition formats. And then we have a, com a very innovative car to 
to to use it and uh, or to use in these competitions. So to to us, it's just one yeah further let's say step in the in the broadening of what VCO does. And Vicarus is a separate entity. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, there will be much more coming from this brand. I would say VCO specifically three years. What a success story, right? Rising to the forefront of sim racing by being unique. As you know, I'm a part of the VCO family, and it is like esports racing, or like esports opposed to sim racing. What does the future hold for VCO? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, as you know us, we are quite spontaneous people, yeah. So we always do it step by step, and there are new ideas coming in. Um, I think at the moment it's about uh, consolidating what we have built. So 23 will definitely see a best off of what we've done so far. So we definitely will continue the esports racing league. We have. I mean, the season highlight will come already end of February, where we have our first live event um, in Hamburg, in Arcadia, the home of the unicorns of love, but they have a great esports facility. Um, and uh, yeah, we have never done this thing before. So it will be VCO style, I would say. I don't know if it's the best live event ever done. Yeah? So we cannot rent a hotel in Monaco and do Gran Turismo there. But, uh, but it will be special, I think, and we put a lot of effort into this. Uh, we will continue with the yeah, crazy bits like Infinity. Yeah? So uh, I think this was the first in May uh, where we did this concept of 24 races. Plus in, next week. In uh, 24 hours, yeah. And then we thought, okay, we thought it's just a one-off, but people liked it. And then we said, okay, we bring the concept back in December. So next weekend, this is a sleepless, sleepless weekend Please for us. Please explain the format to people who've made oh, well, it. It's unbelievable. I mean, the basic idea is that, um, that it's a 24-hour race, but split into 24 our races yeah? so it's 45 minute races on iRacing five different cars five different tracks used um, and the teams send in five drivers and they can decide which race do they do so what what the thrill of this format is you really have 24 race starts 24 finishes uh, everything is reset after one race so it's basically a season and to be honest if you count the hours it's more than a season uh, within just one day and I really love that idea and it turned out really nicely last year and this year, the, or now for next weekend, the special thing is that it's a pro sim edition. So we merged the pro sim format that we did uh, in 2020 and 21 uh, with Infinity. So at least six of the 24 races need to be done by a pro driver. I mean, uh, I think the lines have blurred. Yeah, so I feel bad calling someone pro if there's a sim racing pro uh, next to him, but uh, or her. Um, yeah, but it will be unique. Uh, it will be good fun. I, I hope people like it again. But uh, yeah, it's an exhausting week and a half. Christoph, from the outside, again, part of my ignorance, I don't know your sim racing history, but watching VCO from afar, what's your perception of sim racing been because of VCO? I heard about uh, VCO some years ago and I thought uh, it's a great idea finally coming to sim racing as a more as in a pro sport. I started sim racing in 2014 with GTR, the first time that sim racing gets a bit more professional. For me, always, I was in the midfield, in the upper one, <laughs> not a pro, but I love to do sim racing. And for me, it's, it's also a feeling to uh, that what you want to do with a race car and you can't do maybe your family's own. You can bring it up to your desk and you can play with that. And as, as flowing come first time to me, I said, okay, you don't need to explain nothing about sim racing about me. It's, it's a passion for everybody of us, also my team. And this was great for us to jump into making something for sim racing coming up to, to racing. How did you get into sim racing? I've never asked you this question. Oh, well, it, it was a, well, in our real life, you know, we have a PR and marketing agency and one of our big customers with three letters uh, asked for a strategy or what can we do in sim racing. So we came from the real world motor racing side and then we're forced to look into it. And then it was like a revelation, yeah, because, okay, why haven't I done this earlier? And so we looked into it and then the ideas kept coming and say, okay, we can do stuff here which are impossible in the real world. And we built our own team. Then we thought, okay, is there any organization like VCO, you know, that offers some creative stuff and so on? And uh, yeah, so this was the beginning. But I must say, um, as much as I love real world motorsport and I've worked there for 20 years, I must say I never had so much fun as in sim racing over the past three years. And um, so we are still fired up like on day one. Where do you think VCO can bridge the gap between amateur drivers and pro drivers? Of course, you know, we do cater primarily for the top teams, but we are starting to see more and more community teams come and get involved. So how do you feel like VCO can help that? Yeah, I mean, we are, we are definitely having this on the agenda. And yes, many of our competitions are invite only, if you want, but the invitations are not 
in a sense restricted by only letting the big teams in. I mean, if you look at the ERL field, I think we, we had top teams or many top teams there, but also teams that normally would not be on this stage. And uh, so we never make a big distinction, I would say. And if you look at our latest project, the uh, Flex Dream series, we do it together with uh, LFM uh, on ACC. I mean, we had over 100 entries for that and we did broadcast three splits. I think nobody has ever broadcast also split two or split three of an, of an event. What about the draft? Like uh, yeah. The view numbers yeah. of a draft. Yeah. 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 There's an innovative BOP concept that we applied that was developed by Niels Naujoks and, uh, and uh, this draft show, I mean, had more viewers than, than uh, races. Yeah? So I think uh, Flexstream is a very good example for let's just try out new things, let's push. And it was totally open. So we let every team in. Yeah? And it was so funny because... Uh, sometimes you, you know how it is and there are, I don't know, it's not toxic, but then there are, hey, how can you do this and that and so on. And these teams did not expect, you know, that we just keep listening and then we change things. So this is also a thing that with VCO is very important to, to us, yeah, that we, that we are not offering the perfect product, yeah. We just need to start something and then it's a moving target and we can want to improve it all the time with the people who are driving in it on teams and I think this is what we will continue and we had yeah really made good experience with it. With Vicarus do you anticipate other companies to come into this space and become a capacitor? We never thought about it but of course everybody's invited let's say like this. I mean actually we are entering the scene and we want to be a competitor to Ferrari and Lamborghini and the others yeah uh, but I think that the, that the possibilities are endless. You know, I mean, if you, if the if the automotive industry or if uh, let's say suppliers, we just talked about it, if they want to showcase products in a virtual environment, in a virtual car. I mean, everyone talks about the metaverse. Um, no one has an answer at the moment. I think how it looks like, or everyone's trying something. Uh, and I always tell people, I think sim racing is the best metaverse you get at the moment. If you are entering a virtual track with a VR. Uh, uh, glasses and so on. So, I mean, what, what else do you need? Yeah, And you have to buy a product from a manufacturer or from a sim racing platform. So, there are all ingredients that would define the meta, metaverse for me, uh, while all the others are still looking for the, for the key to the gate. Yeah? So, I think this, there's a huge potential for yeah, sim racing to, um, yeah, to open up virtual possibilities. And I think Bikaros is a, is a great first step from our end. And, um, um, and I hope the others will do it as well, uh, but I don't care, you know, I mean, yep, we just absolutely. do our thing. Yeah. We open a door for that. Huh? Yes, so, pardon if I'm not understanding this right, so for instance, uh, the RO, uh, ROC, Race of Champions, they make their own car for the championship, so in future we could have like a next level car, like they've made their own car, you've got a Logitech G, they've made their own car, and then you, like, so you have five races, and you use a different car each time, but that's how you brand the competition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these possibilities are there. Yeah, and uh, and I mean, our dream obviously is that someone, some uh, wealthy guy, shows up and says, "I want to drive a Vicarus in real life." Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the way that this car is designed, it is possible. So it's not like you know, there's there's nothing in there and so on. So it's a it's a it's a proper car design, and this is why it takes longer, but it is very in depth and very detailed and so on. So uh, we just started. We will see where where it takes us, what will come out of it, but. In the end, we will use these cars in our own competitions, and uh, this is the starting point for us. So, the, you just said the possibility to make it into a real car. Could you maybe explain a little bit further on that? Because that sounds, to me, crazy. Absolutely crazy. That's what we are. <laughs> well, I, I know Florian is for sure. No, really, um, the car is based on a real car package, what I told before. So, of course, it's possible, and um, at, at the moment we have seen only one picture for the interior, and if you will see the, picture, the, the interior, we, we placed from the beginning also the package persons inside, so they have the space for sitting inside. And what we did from the beginning, and this is what a sim racer makes, uh, maybe much more happy with a car like this. If it sits in a GT, real GT3 car, you see you have nothing inside. Only your displays, your steering wheel, seat, nothing more. I said, no, if you sit in a sim racing car, you have to, to feel the environment. And we had designed an environment that is absolutely based on a package. So from my mind, of course, if you start a real development process for one of car or something like this, that needs a lot of time. This is normal, this is the normal car industry development. But we have, we have the base behind of the car that it could be possible, full, absolutely sure. If we can get the image put up behind us once again, I want to ask, what was the inspiration behind the design of the car itself? I think Christoph, yeah, this is your 
The inspiration. The inspiration started. Maybe you see the pictures also. The yeah, inspiration get the picture started. put up behind us. That would be that would be awesome. The inspiration started with research. First, um, what is a GT car? What makes a GT car great? Of course, all of us have a lot of motorsport passion. And now you see also the interior. I think the interior is absolutely amazing, and this is a big difference to a GT car. And the inspiration was first a research. What is the GT cars at the moment in the market? Which car is outstanding from the side of design? So we said the uh, Aston Martin is at the moment the nicest car in the world. And then it started typical design researching. You start with sketches, you define overhangs, you define packages wide of the car. Then we found a lot of things that is uh, later we will see also in videos. Um, we are work on it and animations. We have some, uh, the, the spoilers are moving. We have animations in the car that is something absolutely amazing to give your, this is what you can't work in the, in the racetrack, but in the virtual racetrack, you can feel the car. You can get much more imaginations than you have in a real car. Was there anything that you didn't have to consider in designing because it is initially for a sim? Or was there anything that maybe you had to consider that you wouldn't necessarily have to for a real car? It's maybe like I said, the, the interior was for us very special to build something up that makes the sim racer happy in the car. The sim racer sits in a seat, he has maybe Googles on it, and if you have the Googles in a normal GT3 car, you see the, the, fire, the fire things and so on. And we said, no, we make it absolutely cool for you. Let it look like this picture again. We have an HMI, like in a real car, something with mirrors, click left and right to the steering wheel. And yeah, what makes a difference to a real car? The real car has a lot, a lot of restriction of aerodynamics. We said, okay, we want aerodynamics. We have some reasons in what makes aerodynamics great. But of course, the, if I do a design for a race car, I lose a lot of the design where the designer starts at the beginning because then the aerodynamic guy comes and say, no, 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 you have to make it round or you have to push up on the other edge. So this is what we don't have in the car. We, have, we had the full passion and the freedom to bring our design like we wanted with some reasons and absolutely we have some ideas behind aerodynamics, but not like you do in a real car. I'm going to go back to you now, Florian, about VCO and we have our own little version of the Oscars now. We have the VCO Simis, which is, was uh, brainstormed a couple of years ago and it's just completely taken off. If you could explain to people watching at home what the VCO Simis are and how important they are to champion our heroes of the space. Yeah, again, I mean, this uh, started quite early in the first year of our existence in 2020. And it was like, we were looking at things, with, what is missing in sim racing? What have, has no one done so far? And then we always got these newsletters from eSports Awards, yeah? And so it was a big thing and everyone was getting involved and say, okay, why not doing it as well? And, um, and the general idea was also to do it right. So whenever we do it, we try to do it, you know, special and something. So we had these trophies created, yeah, that are not like trophies you can order next door or something. So they are handmade, special design. They are, they are really worth something and valuable. So uh, this was very important to us. And so we started it in 2020. Um, we, we did nominations from the community. So we asked the community to send in nominations. And then the second phase is the voting phase where the, where the nominees that were, let's say, selected in the end of, um, or, or brought up by the community you can be voted on. Um, and yeah, I think in the first year, I don't know how many entries we had, maybe 600 votes or something. So uh, we were still young and small and so on. And now this grew and um, I think for this year's semis we had almost 5,000 votes. Wow. I mean, you know, it's, it's a big thing because people have to click 11 or make 11 the, selections. The first two years don't count, right? Like they were, because our junior and Lewis's awards, yeah, were, yeah, obviously. they were practice yeah, yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This one really means yeah, something this yeah. year. No, and I mean, uh, and we also had some learnings, you know, then there was the North American Oval community saying, hey, what, what is this? Yeah, I mean, your, your awards don't count because it's just European biased. Yeah, then we put in a new category, best oval racer. Yeah, so it was that we also reacted on, on community feedback and so on. And, I mean, it really should be uh, an honor or, or an, I don't know, appreciation of what these guys have done over the past year. Um, and I know the outcome of this year's vote, and I must say it feels, it feels right. And this is so important to me, you know, that, okay, if I would judge it totally objectively, I would maybe even select these guys. And so I think that the community really, really, uh, yeah, brought up realistic uh, and, and cool results. So we will have 10, uh, 10 uh, winners in 10 categories and a new Hall of Famer. So we also have a Hall of Fame. Uh, so uh, Jimmy Broadbent, well, in the first year, the Hall of Famer was a vote, which was not clever. Uh, so Jimmy got the vote because he has so many fans. I think he's quite young for a Hall of Fame yeah, already, but uh, anyway, 
Then last year it was I Liveries, uh, Juan Di Sanchez, who uh, who has done a lot for the community. Yeah. And this year we will have a new member. I'm excited about it. Yeah, the show will be aired on 26th of December. So after having having Christmas meals and all that, you can just uh, watch the show. And to be honest, it's the only show we do in the year which is not live. Um, so I will sit there and uh, just watch with my family and have popcorn. We've spoken about uh, Infinity with a flex stream. We've got the, the World Cup coming up in February, the second iteration of it, actually. What's new for the next 12 months? What are you pushing to do? I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> normally, I love announcing new things, yeah? But to be honest... I'm trying. I'm trying to get something uh, here. No, but uh, to be, to be quite, quite open, I think we've done so many new things, we just have to keep doing them. And uh, I mean, flex stream goes until, I think, end of February. So it's still something for 23. I mean, just yesterday we brainstormed with a couple of people and had already two or three great new ideas, uh, quite silly ones, to be honest, but I think we will go for it. So uh, it will be new things coming up. Um, but, you know, it, it, it could, be, could be something that comes to our mind in June and we do it in August. Yeah? So it's, uh, uh, but, but the program is huge for us and uh, our community is growing, I would say, and this is what we want to be. We want to provide cool competitions that are entertaining to watch and and also great for the competitors to be a part of. And uh, I think uh, sometimes we achieve it, sometimes we learn and make mistakes, then we, then we do it better, yeah? but this is uh, how we approach the whole thing. What is your favorite VCO competition to watch? I started this year to watch it with the IMSA series. <laughs> That's uh, really good. Sure, next, next year we can competition, each on the street. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, IMSA, IMSA was a great thing for us. Yeah? I mean, um, we, we cooperated with them. Uh, it was so great to see IMSA doing a fully-fledged sim racing series. Uh, again, many things to learn. Uh, not everything perfect from our end, maybe, but uh, I think the outcome was great. I think the racing was mega. Um, IMSA was really happy, and I think this will also be an option to continue next year, but we have to discuss it. But I think things like that are showing that we are... Uh, yeah, that we are doing our own uh, projects, which we love, yeah, but we can also, let's say, help someone or assist someone like IMSA uh, to, to put a great show up together with iRacing yeah, uh, that provide the mega platform for this. So, um, so this was a great project, but let's see what happens next year. And it will, I'm, I'm sure there will be things popping up that I even uh, don't know about it yet. Yeah, we discuss quite often that sim racing in general and not just VTO doesn't get the view numbers that it probably deserves. Some of the productions that we have are incredible, right? How do you feel we can to get to that point? How can we grow? I think we need a revolution in counting, yeah? uh, uh, because this is what we, what we did with the first Flex Stream race now, where we put in the regulations that everyone who wants to stream uh, needs to put in a little logo rotation thing. You know, we don't want to force anyone to put anything in their streams. But uh, this is what we did, because we think you have to count every POV stream into the viewership of the event. Um, and this is what we did for the first time, and the result for the first Flex Stream race was 130,000 views on the day after. So it was not like views that accumulated course, over four yeah. weeks or something. So this shows us this, this route is the right way. And the, the basic broadcast that we provide is great, and the core for sure, but still, um, yeah, maybe we should even rethink this and see how can we, how does a broadcast of the future look like? I mean, I think we should show maybe the lifetiming permanently in the broadcast. We should jump to different drivers and show them as a person because I think the viewing behavior on Twitch is you want to see one guy or one driver doing things and not so much maybe a produced show like we did, have done it for the past three years. So I think it's still open for discussion and a moving target, but I think we have to rethink also how we broadcast things. Um, and seeing these figures from Flickstream, I mean, if we go to partners and say, okay, per race we have 130,000 viewers uh, across 55 channels, but this is basically what other series do, and they accumulate figures of potential technical reach in Thailand, yeah? um, and then you get to 13.5 million. I mean, we just look at the, at the real figures that we can see and that we can measure, and uh, with figures like this, I'm really proud. Uh, and I'm, by the way, I'm proud of every single viewer that is watching a race. I mean, even if you have 100 on, on Twitch, then it's worth to do this show, yeah? because we started from zero, and everyone who bothers to watch a VCO event is uh, it's, it's sensational. So I think we have to count differently. Does the responsibility need to fall on the teams as well? Because in the real world of motorsport, they, teams have to pay a fortune to go and race. For instance, Formula One, DTN, they've got to pay a fortune to do it. 
Whereas in sim racing, they don't. It's free, right? They can just come and sign up and win money. They need to do a bit more maybe on social media. And obviously the Flexstream rules kind of adhere to that. Yeah. I mean, the, the Flexstream regulations remind the teams that they, uh, that they maybe increase their prize money even if they, if they do preview posts or whatever. Yeah? I think it's not so much to put the burden of, of monetarization to the teams. I think this, uh, this still is the job of the, of the promoter or of the organizer. I don't know, sorry, I mean pr yeah. promoting by tweeting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I didn't mean anything monetary. No, 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 yeah. I mean, just showing up, doing a race, and then expecting the payment of 10,000 euro prize money. Yeah, yeah, this could work, yeah, but uh, obviously it's nicer if, uh, if, if a team engages with the series and, 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 and with the platform. I mean, uh, if you look at Formula One, yeah, they are Formula One teams, and they are They are, uh, and this is their DNA, yeah. And um, I, th I feel, not compared to Formula One, but I feel, let's say, with the ERL, that the competing teams feel like an ERL team, you know. And this is what I like so much that they are, well, the smaller teams, they are maybe even proud to compete against the top teams. Maybe it's a bit different for the top teams to do this event and then they do another one and everyone invites them anyway. But, but I think to, to get or to offer something which is worth feeling something about it and not just competing and say okay the, uh, these are BCO are idiots anyway so this is always our goal to connect with the teams and to give them a good environment and then it's our job to, to get some money in uh, to, to give them prize money and all the, all the hard stuff I would say obviously this car that, we, that you have I think we have built trying to take credit yeah, here uh, that you have built will be in the consumer's hands at some point and you know it's going to be built specifically for competition but what about the average Joe someone like me What characteristics of the car should they be looking forward to? Oh, the Vicarious car, you mean? I think someone like you or me, like we don't do other professional races, um, we would love to jump into the car and we will enjoy the feeling of the interior. Like I told before, you have to see how it works with all these um, new techniques that could be inside in the car. So, of course, I think everybody is invited to, to drive to each and you will love it, for sure. Yeah, no, man. We are just talking about the end of the design process here. Yeah? Uh, so now the physics process has started again as well. So, um, yeah, and so we don't communicate any uh, horsepower or something just yet. Um, this will all be part of the second phase, but the car is there in the virtual sphere now, and now we, uh, now we build the, let's say, ideally physics that, uh, that are benchmarked, yeah? and this is the next step. Um, then it gets implemented hopefully in as many sims as possible so uh, it's a step by step thing but we thought it's good to show the world every step of it so first we launched the brand now we show the age um, and uh, yeah so we'll continue until February well, obviously we have the, uh, the World Cup coming up and the races are short sharp you know 1v1s the esports kind of scenario how have team managers specifically taken to this and have you had to deal with much negativity or has it been mostly positive? No, I would say mostly positive. I mean, uh, we have gained a bit of confidence over the past three years. So uh, everyone knows the regulations and if someone is not happy about a format thing, I mean, then, then they can bring it up. But I mean, if you sign up, then this is the, the way it is in the end. Yeah, yeah we want to redefine things and help to improve things. But the general format is not up for discussion, I would say. So, um, but I think that the people or that the drivers and the teams really enjoyed it. I mean, our goal was to provide a competition where you can build a history, you know, a history of the rivalry between Apex and Redline in an iRacing final. Yeah? And this is what happened. So we can have stats. Okay, it's like RHG have won against this team uh, this number of times or lost against them, whatever. So this is what is to, well, this is what is missing a bit in, in sim racing, that there is a sort of some stats and some things you can relate to. I mean, I don't know how, which team is the or has won the iRacing Daytona the most often. I'm sure somewhere the stat is given, yeah, but I think this is a mega achievement for a team if they have won it three times or five times. So do you count like uh, split 14? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm do, a winner. Do you count this? Yeah, but the data is there. Yeah, So I think you can do a lot with, with data, but in our case with the ERL, it's, it's much more direct. You can say which driver has got the most podiums in the competition um, uh, or has won the, the um, three versus one thing. So This is also an aspect of the ERL that we have, that we have rivalries in the making, and you see, okay, this team is a surprise because they made it into the semi-final and they have done it for the first time. So you have first times, you have uh, a couple of times, you have they are the big champions and have won 55 times. So, but there is a statistic section to this 
which is maybe missing in other series where you only have a championship table and, uh, uh, and that's it. Yeah? And I also like the MVD thing, the most valuable driver. Yeah, yeah? I mean, uh, Enzo Vedito wins it every year, but this shows who's that... A, who's Enzo? <laughs> who's Enzo? I mean, you have a, uh, this is the, the sign that, uh, that if there's a flexible driver, he can do it on ACC, iRacing and R-Factor uh, too, then... Um, then he will become the MVD and get some extra prize money. So I think some aspects that we created, they work really well. As someone that follows uh, tennis, golf, I, I love the, the majors, the Grand Slam, and you currently do that with VCO. Is there a plan to maybe in future, once you become a little bit more established, that you have your own four competitions that become the four majors of VCO? Oh, well, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, the... Uh, the ERL is structured like this, that there is a Masters event in the end, and it's multi-platform already, so we are ticking a few boxes there. I mean, in terms of Grand Slams, I'm, I think our cooperation with iRacing is just uh, uh, top-notch. Yeah? I mean, it's such a great opportunity that they let us partner with them for one of the, or some of their biggest races. Um, so this is also something that which we did for the first time in 2020, the VCO Grand Slams on iRacing, and it's a big honor to be involved there. And you know, and we always try to bring in something extra. So we brought Radio Show Limited, John Heindorf and his team to commentate on this uh, and, to, and to be there. We do trophies for the races. Um, and I quite like that it's not connected with a points system. And, uh, I mean, we don't have to turn everything into championships and so on. Uh, it's just a big thing to be involved with these, let's say, mass events. Yeah, I mean, if there are 5,000 drivers competing in a race, to me, or 10 or 15, this is, this is the biggest motor racing event on the planet, you know, that is happening at this time in terms of participants, yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a great thing, so I would say that this VCO Grand Slam topic with iRacing is uh, also one of the core pillars of, uh, of uh, what we do Awesome stuff, well I want to say thank you so much for your time, it's been incredible to talk about the Vicarious Car by Munich Design and of course the future of VCO what's currently happening with VCO 